now listening to Protecting Your Nest with Board Certified Family Medicine and Obesity Medicine Specialist, Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com. Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. In August, I was invited to speak at the Symposium for Metabolic Health by Doug Reynolds and Pam Devine. Of course, I eagerly accepted this invitation, but then came the hard work of thinking about, well, what the heck am I going to talk about? After some pondering and consideration, I thought the importance of bringing people together, which suits who I am, was an important topic to to address. And, And who am I bringing together? Well, I'm trying to bring together vegans and carnivores So my topic was entitled, How Vegans and Carnivores Can Live in Harmony. You know, we live in a a cynical world, especially when we consider how polarizing the political landscape is in our home country, which is the United States. And I'm sure that's true abroad as well. But just because this is our current state doesn't mean our future can't be brighter. I do imagine a future where vegans and carnivores can have mutual respect you know, but waiting for that to happen won't guarantee that it will. It actually will be up to each and every one of us to develop a sense of tolerance, but most importantly, to add to the conversation and making our own contributions so that we can see the future we all desire. Now, during my talk in San Diego, I shared 15 lessons that could possibly get us to a better future, one of which was regenerative farming a topic I covered with the great Diana Rogers of the Sacred Cow documentary in a previous podcast. I'll make sure to have a link to that as well. Today, I wanted to introduce you to two more soldiers in the regenerative farming space. My hope is that this discussion will both increase your knowledge and inspire you to help make the world a more sustainable place to live. Today's guest is Tara Vander Dusen and Natalie Korovic. Cor- Corverick, an environmental scientist, dairy farmer, and a pharmacist rancher who founded Discovery AG, where the message of regenerative farming is shared via a podcast and docuseries. The mission is to pioneer conversations around relevant and trendy news on topics in the agriculture and food space while ultimately reconnecting us back to the hands that feed us. Today, my hope is that we will bust some of the myths related to farming and learn what can be done to improve how this type of farming is done. With that, I welcome both of you to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Thanks for having us on. We're excited to share with you and your audience. I'm excited. And I think uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee and his lovely girlfriend, who were probably the link that connected us. I know you saw some of me on that platform, and I'm happy you found me. I'm happy we found each other because I'm a huge fan of the work Diana Rogers is doing and others uh, who are in that space. Um, I just think it's so important that we find new ways to make the planet a better place, and I think regenerative farming will be one of the things we'll you know talk about a little bit today. So let's start our conversation uh, with both of you sharing how you landed in the agricultural and food space. Yeah, I'll kick it off, Tara, here. Um, I'm actually a fifth-generation dairy farmer, so I grew up on my family's dairy farm in eastern New Mexico. Ended up marrying uh, my husband, who is also a fifth-generation dairy farmer. So lots of family and dairy in um, you know our family heritage and history. Um, I actually left the farm and got my degree in environmental science. And then after marrying my husband, moved back to his family farm and started working as an environmental consultant in the dairy space. So helping other producers, other farmers, uh, with, you know, water conservation, manure management, soil health. Uh, I always joke it's like the back end of the dairy was kind of my job uh, and less with the cows uh, and more with the manure and ultimately ended up sharing my story on social media. And that connected me actually with Natalie after a few years of sharing. And that is where we launched um, our podcast. 
So Tara and I have some similarities to our background and how we got to where we are. I also grew up in agriculture. I grew up on a cattle ranch in Southwest Montana um, as a fourth generation. And I too ended up leaving and taking a little bit different of a path before I, you know, found myself back on a ranch, but I got my degree in pharmacy and I actually practiced full-time pharmacy for about 10 years. I lived in a, you know, it's relative, but I lived in a bigger city in Montana, (laughs) depending where someone tuning in, it could still be very small to that. (laughs) But, um, I really thought that'd be my life. I was very, you know, I lived in proximity to our family ranch and I spent a lot of time there, but I, I really didn't envision myself, um, you know, back on the ranch. I definitely didn't envision myself having an income drive from, you know, agriculture, but I ended up meeting and marrying my husband. And that is how I ended up in central Nebraska, which is where we ranch now. And like Tara, I also started sharing online. I really, um, actually beginning, I wanted to, uh, create a ranch to consumer or direct to consumer beef business. So I wanted to sell our meat from our ranch, you know, directly to anyone across the U S. And so I was using, social media as a marketing platform for that. And then, you know, some twists and turns eventually led me to Tara where, like she said, we started our podcast, Discover Ag. Nice. Yeah. You know, me being a city boy in Chicago, right? Um, This visual of life on a ranch. uh, One thing that I will say, um, the one thing that I did uh, prior to my current role, and I would say maybe about 16 years ago is I would do insurance physicals and and the insurance physicals were for those higher you know income earning folk and they needed a doctor to be involved and so I would sometimes go to a high rise in downtown Chicago meet a lawyer and sometimes I would go to a farm right and it was like can we meet you at like five in the morning I mean <laughs> <laughs> like what <laughs> oh, I am that's not so true. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, early and it was and it was so weird because I would drive there and it's so early in the morning it was like dark no lights anywhere you know and you're like I'm lost and navigation was trying to do its best but so I remember those but one thing I always felt is that these are some hard working folk I just you know I always felt that so so I think what I'm curious about is um What's what's the day in the life of a rancher, and particularly from a female perspective, what roles are you guys playing um, in that process? Yeah, I can kick us off. So mine will be from the dairy farmer side. So day in the life of a dairy farmer um, is a lot of routine. While you know there's differences every single day. One of the things about a dairy farm is um, our cows really love a routine. They like to be milked twice a day, every day at the same time every day. They're very punctual creatures, creatures of habit, and we feed them twice a day. They have access to you know fresh water. Um, the way our dairy is, it's uh, what's called open lot. So the cows are in large open corrals. Is what you can kind of think of. And, um, you know, we can get into kind of the feed and all of those things. Um, but I'm touched on what I do. So on my part of the dairy, uh, I interacted, I interact less with the cows and more with how can we conserve water in our barn? How can we collect all of our rainwater to be used to water our crops? Um, how can we use manure from our dairy that we compost as a natural fertilizer? Uh, so there's just a lot of different components to the dairy. Uh, my husband is very much the, uh, cow man. He's the one involved with the milking and the feeding and those things. So we definitely, every person, you know, on our farm um, has their role and what they contribute mm-hmm. to the farm. And so it's really cool to see how it all comes together to make the operation work. Yeah. And while dairy farming, like Tara said, is very repetitive from day to day, I would say ranching is repetitive from season to season. So mm-hmm. not so much day to day. Um, actually, usually we're never typically doing what we did the day before, but you can, you know, zoom out quite a bit and we would calve at the same time of the year. So we'd go through calving the same, um, you know, maybe we're weaning at the same time of the year. So we would do that. And, you know, during the summer we're moving cattle out at pasture a lot. And so there's a lot of consistency throughout the year and in big term, but not so much from day to day. As far as my role, I, I actually stepped away from pharmacy two years ago now. I think it was two years. Um, I'm in very rural Nebraska, so I live outside a town of about 2,000 people. And we did have a critical access hospital, though. So for a while, I did you know, work part-time there, and I loved serving my community in that manner. But um, I ultimately ended up to step away to do more of the social media and then also just be more present on our operations. So 
I like to say I'm a fair weather rancher. Um, hmm. I'm very present and active, you know, during the warmer seasons, the months, because I have littles that we tote around with us who are often very present um, and at our side. And during the winter, that gets a little bit harder to have the kids outside all the time, weather dependent. Um, I'm very fortunate that I wouldn't say I'm like an employee of the operation, so I don't have to like go to work and clock in. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm definitely, you know, outside with my husband, you know, whether we're like moving cows or putting out salt and mineral or doing, you know, just a general herd health check. Um, I'm, I'm present along his side for all those things, but I have more fluidity. And then to kind of touch on like women's role in agriculture, um, you know, we, we are the minority. I think uh, the last census said that there was about 28% of women is the statistic for um, agriculture. I do think it's increasing and has been up, but I think the really amazing thing about being a woman in agriculture is we, there's a lot of room and space for us to be um, involved in the way we want. So I have a lot Mm -hmm. of friends and I know a lot of women that are the, the main, you know, caretaker, like not, not necessarily what Tara and I do. And as we mentioned, it's our husband that are more in that role, but there's a lot of women where they're the lead rancher, they're the lead farmer. Um, and maybe their spouse is the one that works off the operation. And then there's a lot of women who are involved in, you know, maybe the bookkeeping or delivering the meals during harvest. And so mm-hmm. there's just a lot of ways. Um, it takes a lot to make a farm and ranch work. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's really, I think there's, it's nice that it, um, as we have progressed in society, we are able to fill different roles in different ways. Um, and ultimately it usually comes down to the family and that women's choice of what works best for them. Cool. Um, one of the things I did uh, in San Diego uh, was, you know, kind of getting a feel for how we look at animals. And so in order to kind of share that message, I I had on my way to San Diego for the conference, um, I actually saw the movie for the first time, My Octopus Teacher. I don't know if you have you guys seen that movie? No, okay. not yet. Not yet. No. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, I should have the link to the movie too, right? So <laughs> I watched it on Netflix. I figured out how to download videos to my phone, and uh, and and what I loved about that movie is that I learned about it. There was a social media couple that uh, the, the 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 lady was a vegan, and the guy was more of an animal base. Okay, and. But they were living in harmony because that was the theme of my whole talk, right? And when he um, watched that movie, because what the movie does without giving it away, it humanizes the octopus, right? And so for him, that then led to him as the social media influencer to be, you know, pause a little bit about eating octopus, you know. Now, the irony is that a, a, a lecture that occurred before that showed this beautiful kitty cat in one of the slides of a previous speaker. And our perception of, and, and the speaker said, I would never eat my cat, right? So it's all this, so it's all about perception of, you know, and, and what's interesting about this is that all animals, for the most part in the wild, eat other animals, right? So it's like, so us trying to reconcile that can be a challenge. So my question for you guys are, when you think about um, how we interpret this hunter-prey way of thinking, should it be okay to eat animals? What's been your evolution? I know you guys have a very different perspective because unlike people who go to the local grocery store, you understand where things come from, right? In a, in, at a higher level. But how, how have you reconciled that issue uh, that people who are more vegan may struggle with and, and, and then feel like, you know, I'm okay with my current state that I am involved in this. But sometimes the, in fact, the quote that I want to say before you comment that I had in my presentation is said, in order to have life, you must have death, right? And I just think that's what it is, but people struggle with that. So give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I have a few thoughts, um, kind of two different directions I want to go. But uh, one of them is, is I think that every food we eat has, 
you know, an impact on the planet, whether that's a plant or an animal. It's using resources. It's utilizing nutrients. There is a cost. There is a toll on the earth for each food that we eat. And taking pause for all of those foods, whether they're animal-based or plant-based, I think is something that's really important. I know in our house, um, I have two young girls and our freezer has a lot of our own beef in it. It's, you know, we have dairy cows, but we still end up beefing cattle and that that cattle fill our freezer. Mm -hmm. We also have some of our cheese and some of our milk in our fridge. And it's a big part of our conversation with our girls whenever we are consuming something, whether it's our steak or maybe it's a new food that we're trying, is having a conversation about where that food came from and taking like appreciation for it. So if we're having our steak, you know, we make sure we talk about that openly, Mm -hmm. that this steak, you know, this this cattle, this beef came from our cattle out there in our backyard. And um, I do think that as you mentioned that, you know, Natalie and I probably have a different perspective than other people. And I would say that's one of them is that we see the circle of life every single day in so Mm -hmm. many different ways. I mean, in any given day, there's a calf being born in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I know what a struggle looks like. I I know, you know, when we've had predators, you know, come onto our farm, like I know what that looks like, like the good and the bad. Um, You'll see it all on a farm. And it just gives you, I think, an appreciation for the food you're consuming and, and just to take a moment to pause when you're having a meal to Mm -hmm. think about that. I guess that's kind of the approach that we take that I take, you know, in our family. Yeah. I will say it's very almost natural for me to consume meat, you know, growing up around it. That was, I just didn't really know any different, you know, when you're Mm -hmm. younger, what you know is what you know. And so in in my eyes, it was like everyone had a freezer full of beef that they could access it all the time. And everyone knew exactly where that animal came from and how it was cared for and what went into, you know, growing it, raising it and harvesting it. Um, So it's definitely something that I, I, I see why people who are removed from the food system have the questions they do and they have the concerns they do. Um, And sometimes they have the stances they do because when you are removed, you know, that, that leaves that gap, that space for all of those things to fill in, which is, you know, one of the downfalls of going to 2% feeding, you know, a hundred percent. Right. Um, I will say that I think we are at an advantage raising the food because when you are closer to it, um, you don't have those questions, you concerns, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think for a lot of people who come from the animal welfare standpoint, they are maybe getting their information, from a documentary or an mm-hmm. article they read or a, a picture that was, you know, um, maybe not taken in the best light or a picture that maybe represents 0.01% of the industry, not the mm-hmm. 99.9%. And so um, it it's unfortunate because I believe the closer you are to the food system, mm-hmm. the more you actually would believe in it, trust in it and support it. I think there's a documentary out there that says, you know, no one would eat meat if they had to harvest their own cow Mm -hmm. or chicken. Mm -hmm. Um, And Tara and I always say that we think it'd be the exact opposite, that you would actually probably would because you would see, you would know, and you would feel more connected to it. And I Mm -hmm. think, um, I think that's a big barrier to it is um, just being, having that connection point. Yeah. I was fortunate to be in um, the documentary by Vinny Tortorich, uh, uh, um, you know, talking about the impossible. So it was called Beyond Impossible, right? And one of the things they talked about in the documentary was this idea that if you're, you know, going back to that quote, if there's going to be life, there's going to be death. And I think a lot of people, which is what I tried to message, one of the talking points was this idea that you can grow vegetables without harming animals. And the way vegetables are grown in this country, rather you're talking about the bugs, the little rodents, or the, the the fact that the birds won't have bugs to eat, it's there's death involved. Uh, and I think that there probably is not a full recognition of that. And I think what you're saying is if you're if you're on the farm and you see maybe even how the farm uh, can, uh, you know, if it's done the wrong way, commercial farming, there's a lot of harm. And I think that rather you do it that way or not, that it's just part of this, this circle of life. So, so I think we should touch a little bit about, um, you know, talk a little bit about regenerative farming, because I think uh, to the extent we can do the best we can under the circumstances that we have, regenerative farming is probably a good way to do that. So let's, let's make sure the average person understands what that term means and contrast it with traditional farming 
and and why that's important, rather it's the carbon footprint or anything else you want to share. Yeah, so regenerative ag, to give a little bit of the terms, and then we can dive into the rest of it. But the term regenerative, you know, it's hard it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it means. It means something different to everybody. And I actually think that's what I love about regenerative ag is what regenerative ag means to Natalie in Nebraska is not what regenerative ag is going to mean to me in New Mexico. Every farm, every location, every geography is going to be slightly different because regenerative ag is about working with your land, working with your mm-hmm. natural resources to give back to, you know, leave the land in better shape than what it is. And I think at the heart of a lot of farmers and ranching, that is like where their core is, where their morals lie, is leaving their land, their cattle, you know, better than the condition they got it. And, you know, one of the things too about regenerative ag is it truly is kind of a spectrum. It is not a check box. And going back to what you said at the beginning, like the polarizing and the polarizing world we live in, I feel like there is, you know, camps that want you to be like, yes, you're a regenerative, you check all these boxes and like either that or no, you're not. And mm-hmm. I'll take myself for example. Our farm is actually a conventional dairy farm. Our milk goes into the conventional milk supply system. And yet we compost all of our cow manure and it goes out to other farms so that they can improve their soil health. Um, you know, cow manure is a great way to improve soil health. Mm-hmm. And so even though we're a traditional dairy that you think, you know, that you would think of, um, we're even a larger dairy. We're a large family farm, but we have my husband and four of his brothers and their families and my father-in-law and mother-in-law. Like there's a lot of families involved in our farm. Um, but we try to implement regenerative practices year over year. Right now we're undergoing a massive um, solar panel operation where our dairy barns will be powered by solar. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they just so many different things. A lot of what our cattle consume are byproducts, which is a huge piece of this regenerative conversation that nothing goes to waste. We're utilizing everything we can from, you know, what's available to us to feed our cattle and and just to reduce that waste, reduce that carbon footprint. And so I really love how it is that spectrum that, you know, every farmer can take what works for them, what makes sense for their farm, and then improve on it year after year. So um, let's think about um, the differences between grass-fed and, you know, grass-finished versus grain-finished. Many of the people in the community I serve in Chicago, I'm just trying to get them to eat beef, right? So <laughs> I don't care Fighting where it the came good fight. from. Right, exactly. And, and it's, all, it's, not, it's resource intensive, so you have to be careful. I don't want people to get trapped and think, well, I just can't afford the stuff that they sell at Whole Foods, right? And they, even when they they actually brought a Whole Foods, not that that's the only place to get it, but they brought one to uh, the uh, neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. It didn't really last as long as they wanted it to because people just weren't engaged and they couldn't quite get the price at a point where people would uh, uh, you know, want to shop there. Um, but it was so funny when I think about my wife's dad, who's a Mississippi guy. And I remember one day just saying to him, yeah, we're, you know, trying to move towards more grass fed cows. And he was like, "Uh, what else do they eat? (laughs) He couldn't, (laughs) his brain was like, isn't that what they eat anyway? Like, what are you talking about? So, cause he had, he had cows and things like that. He's now in Chicago, but he couldn't get it. But I do think it's helpful for people who are not as familiar with the difference between grass finished beef and grain finished beef. What would you guys say about that? I would say your father-in-law sounds like a wise man because uh, he picked up, like you said, on something that not a lot of people are familiar with, which is whether an animal is going to be grass finished or grain finished. They Mm -hmm. spend the first two thirds of their life the same, the exact same. Mm -hmm. It's out on pasture, eating grass, consuming milk from their mom. Um, So again, it, it's the exact same. It's really no different. It, it's an operation like my husband and I's, um, and they're called cow calf operations. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the, the end is really where you get into the differences when it comes into grass finished versus grain finished. And I will say another kind of common misconception about grain finished is that all they get is grain. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's mm-hmm. not true either because they're still consuming, you know, grass, forage, maybe some byproducts. Um, it's usually grain is just introduced into that. The reason being they want to fatten up the animal and give it that good marbling. So that's why you'll hear people talk about a taste difference between grass mm-hmm. finished and grain finished is grass finished will have less of that, you know, 
the, the fatty marbling that sometimes, you know, people are, um, we definitely consume here more in the U S and some people are more, um, enjoy a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I will say there's a study out of Oklahoma state that, um, shows that when they did a complete life cycle assessment of the diet of a grain finished cattle, um, grain accounted for about 7%. So that might help Mm. people put in perspective of, um, what that means in, in, you know, perspective of the whole entire diet, but really it just comes down to the way, um, our beef system works is like I said, a a cow starts out at a family ranch like mine, and then, uh, we raise it until a certain age and then we sell it off into what's usually Mm -hmm. called a backgrounder. They will raise the animal to a certain stage um, and they will sell that off to a feedlot. And then the feedlot is where that grain would be mm-hmm, introduced right. to the diet. So it's about, you know, four to six months, 90 to 200 days when they're going to have that change in diet that the grass finished animal wouldn't have. Um, you know, like you said at the beginning of this, Tar and I both really stand for food choice. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you, you know, I mean, there are benefits to grass finish because if you, um, you know, kind of referencing your question earlier about regenerative ag, you know, a grazing animal is really beneficial for the soil. It does really great things mm-hmm. for the environment. Um, so if that's one of your stances you want to take when choosing food and you have the access and the income, you know, to afford that um, grass finished beef and that's what you choose, I think that's great. Um, and if you don't, because um, there is also benefits to, you know, feedlot cattle, they actually do have less of a, a footprint because they're finished quicker um, and they don't emit as much methane. And so there's kind of pros and cons to both systems. So if you choose to just want to get meat in your diet um, and you go to the grocery store, I want you to feel really good about that too. Because I think at the end of the day, um, there are pros and cons to both systems. And what's most important is that you're getting that really nutritious whole protein in your diet. When I think about factory farming, um, are are the factory farmed animals raised from the beginning and staying in that environment or are most of the cattle coming from outside that environment into that environment? Yeah. So one of the unique things about the beef industry is that uh, we are not like the chicken or the poultry industry. So unfortunately, animal proteins kind of get lumped together all the time and just talked Mm -hmm. about in one conversation. Uh, chicken and pork are vertically integrated. So like you said, they, um, can be raised in confinement the entire time. They are usually owned by the same person the entire time. That's what vertically integrated means. It easiest example would be like a Tyson. A Tyson would Mm -hmm. own the chicken from the very beginning when it hatches to the very end when it is processed, packaged, and sold. Mm -hmm. Um, That is not how the beef industry works. So that's not what happens when it comes to cattle. The best way I can describe the beef industry for visual people is if you think of an inverted triangle at the top, it is very long and wide, right? And that is operations like my husband and I's. It's a Mm cow-calf operation. There's over 700,000 family ranches in the U.S. The average herd size is about 43. So it's actually very small and very plenty, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then as you work down the triangle kind of through that process I described, you know, from the backgrounder to the feedlot to the packer packing plant, the packing plant would be the big four packers you always Mm -hmm. hear about. And that would be the tip of the triangle. It's where, you know, our kind of pain point of the beef industry is, Mm -hmm. is that we only have four packers. And so cattle are not raised in confinement. Um, beef cattle aren't, it's just not the way the U S system works. Um, they are out at pasture all the way up until the point of you get to the feedlot, um, which would be again, just kind of the last 90 to 200 days of their lives. I had no clue. Yeah. I had, yeah, I had no clue. That's really, (laughs) but that's actually reassuring, right? Like, so that, that makes this idea of regenerative farming, at least from the perspective of a cow, it seems easier to get from where we are to where we want to be because they, it's not that they're not already out there. It's just teaching the farmers how to divide the land in such a way that they can kind of graze and then move to the next part in a, in a systematic way. So that's very reassuring. That's really cool. I love that. So let's talk about, so I had this, uh, again, a city boy, right? So I remember when my kids were little and there's a dairy farm in Indiana that we would take them to when they were little. And then we also took my wife's sister's babies, our nieces, when they were little. And it was fun because you can see what you guys see like every day. We see these little <laughs> <laughs> calves being born. And it, I mean, they're just like an assembly line. You're guaranteed to see at least one while you're there. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, but 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 when, we, but when we visited the Amish community, I remember, and it was, you know, it was, you know, they were like, you can actually just squeeze the 
um what is it called where the milk the comes teat? out the te- right that thing <laughs> 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 and and put your and he said just just get some of the milk directly i was like what <laughs> I mean, I was like, no way I'm going to do that. But of course, I'm the dad and I have to be the adventurous one. So I was like, okay. And it, I was able to directly uh, squirt the milk into my mouth from the animal. So so I guess that raises another question. As a guy that's in this uh, you know, metabolic health space, low carb, I'm always thinking about nutrition. And many people that I've uh, learned from have said that it's best to do raw milk versus, you know, conventional milk. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. Why why was it okay for me to squirt that stuff into my mouth and not kill me and, <laughs> as opposed to being pasteurized? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you touched on a lot of things there. But um, yes, you I mean, you can drink raw milk absolutely straight from the cow. Um, typically, you can also drink it straight from the tank, which is a, a little more processed. It'll, it'll go mm-hmm. through a filter and it'll be cooled down to about mm-hmm. 36 degrees before it goes to the tank. Um, some people obviously do choose to drink raw milk. There is a slight increase in foodborne illnesses. It's pretty low, but that is why in some states you're not able to access raw milk is because of mm-hmm. those concerns around foodborne illnesses. So I actually consumed raw milk um, through most of my childhood and into my adult life and have just recently, uh, since I was about 25, switched over to just regular conventional milk. So I feel like I've had some life experiences (laughs) with all the different milks across the spectrum. And, um, you know, there's differences about each of the milks. I don't necessarily fall in the camp of believing there is like superpowers in the raw milk. I think Mm -hmm. no matter what milk you drink, it is a nutrient powerhouse. It's giving you a ton of bioavailable protein and just has tons of nutrients, whether that is conventional pasteurized or raw milk. Um, So yeah, there's, you know, that's just kind of, I guess, my broad overview of what I think there. But I think uh, some of the cool things about milk I love to share, um, you know, Natalie mentioned how different the beef industry is than like Mm -hmm. uh, poultry or hogs. And then dairy is entirely, you know, different um, industry also. And so, you know, milk is a very local product. So actually at your grocery store, wherever you're at in the United States, typically on average, your milk's going to come from a farm uh, less than a hundred miles away from that grocery store. Mm -hmm. So a very, very local product, no matter which, you know, conventional milk you're buying. Um, And kind of going back to what Natalie said at the beginning, I think the closer you are to your food system, you know, the less you fear it. And that is one of the things like, Mm -hmm. if you cannot afford the grass fed, grass finished milk on the shelf, I as a dairy farmer buy the conventional milk. And I Mm -hmm. feel so good about serving that to my family no matter what. Um, and, and it's, a, you know, a really safe and affordable product. Um, if you choose not to do raw milk, if you're doing conventional milk, kind of the process that it goes through is, you know, it's going to go into our tank, like I said, that's cooled. And then it's going to go from, um, our tank into a truck that is going to be hauled then to the processing plant where it'll be bottled mm-hmm. or turned into cheese. Um, it's tested before it leaves our farm for quality assurance and a number of different things. Um, if for some reason it did not meet those quality standards, it actually would be dumped out on our farm and we would pay mm-hmm. for it. Um, so a lot of assurance is going into milk quality. And to touch a little bit, you know, on the, kind of the factory farming conversation, uh, you know, I mentioned we're a larger scaled operation. We have a lot of family members involved in our dairy. And a cool thing about dairy farming, over 97% of dairy farms are family owned and operated, no matter mm. the size. Size is not always an indicator of whether it's family owned or not, or whether, you know, animal welfare is good or not. Um, our cows actually have a nutritionist that plans their diets. They have a vet that comes out once a week and che- does herd health check and checks in, you know, with with our team. Um, so there's just some really that's really cool pieces of um, what goes into you know making that gallon of milk. And I, I honestly, ninety percent family farm. That's shocking. I mean, you know, honestly, I think these documentaries are destroying our brains because the perception they give is that everything is factory farming. It's all, you know, and I just think that just under hearing these statistical realities is really helpful for me to feel better about our system in this country. And I just think that the misinformation is, uh, you know, creating a lot of confusion. And during my, um, during my conversation at the uh, symposium for metabolic health, I did kind of talk about rabbit holes that we go down. And for me, uh, before I became this low carb doc, 
I was uh, down the plant-based rabbit hole for about eight years. And, you know, once you search for uh, how to keep your family healthy, you go down whatever rabbit hole comes from that Google search, right? So so I think we need to really always question things and, and just say, not, not to just take things for granted, be careful who we trust and believe. And, and But more importantly, which is the tone of that uh, discussion, you know, there's more than one way to uh, heal. And I do have patients who, with the right supplements, can thrive on a plant-based diet. It's not my preference, but they seem to do okay. But I also have a ton of them that I have to, you know, kind of push them in a different direction because we start seeing deficiencies. So so let's talk a little bit about uh, bioavailability of uh, protein uh, and just you know, going back to trying to encourage the ladies to value protein, and we all do for various reasons, uh, there is a difference between how effective you can uh, get the nutrients out of plant protein versus animal protein. So what's been you guys' experience with that conversation? Yeah, so you touched on one of the differences, which we can get into in a second, but I think there's also a couple... Um, Other ones I'd like to highlight too of why, um, again, we stand for food choice. And as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. we're not saying that you can't be healthy on, you know, consuming plant products for your protein. Um, But I, I do think it takes maybe more um, knowledge and access to, to make it work. Right. Um, Whereas it's pretty simple to just eat the meat, the animal proteins. You don't have to do the supplementation. You don't have to be like, you know, calculating things and figuring things out. Um, so animal proteins are complete in all the essential amino acids you need, which plant proteins aren't. And so I think that's a big one that people need to be aware of, um, which would be a reason why you keep hearing us talk about supplementation if you're mm-hmm. going to be on the plant, because you have mm-hmm. to, you know, there's amino acids our body can make and there's amino acids our body can't make. And um, fortunately, animal proteins give us both of those, whereas plant proteins don't. And so you will have to supplement. And that's one reason why I choose to the animal proteins. Um it's also more nutrient dense. So you'll see, you know, you can, just, you can eat broccoli, and get the same amount of steak, or you can eat quinoa and get the same amount mm-hmm. of protein as a steak. And it's like, yes, but you're going to have to eat, you know, how many more cups and like, what is that going to do to your gut and bowels and, um, you know, your overall health. And then, like you said, the other really great thing about, um, plant pro- or animal proteins is that they are more bioavailable. So our bodies just absorb them more naturally. Um, I'm not a total scientist, but I think it has something to do with like the fiber content that is in the plant proteins. And I think they're like encased or wrapped in them a little bit. So it's harder Mm -hmm. for our body to either break them down or absorb them. Um, So I think from a lot of different angles, there's really beneficial things um, to including animal proteins in your diet. Um, You know, maybe that's in addition to the plant proteins, um, or maybe that's trying to focus on getting the animal over the plant proteins. So this summer, you mentioned some of the, you know, documentaries on Netflix that, you know, are very fear-based, very fear-mongering in um, their stances. So one of the things Natalie and I did on our podcast this summer on Discover Ag was um, break down a lot of those documentaries. You know, we Mm -hmm. actually broke down three. I think we're going to do another one in the coming months. And we actually had a registered dietitian on for Game Changers to help us Mm. really break down the nutrition side of that. And it was fascinating to hear, you know, from a registered dietitian, her side of things of exactly what it does take to be plant-based versus, you know, the animal protein and that that bioavailability. And I think one thing that gets, you know, Natalie kind of uh, alluded to this, but like the nutrient density, you know, if we remove animal protein, uh, we are removing a nutrient dense food. And a lot of times when people do that, they end up increasing their calorie intake, Mm -hmm. which can have the opposite effect of, you know, what you want to do. So like game changers, for example, you had these really extreme athletes who were able to consume large amounts Mm -hmm. of calories and be able to get the nutrients they needed for, you know, an average person who is getting to the gym, maybe three times a week, you just don't need that caloric intake, um, to be able to, you know, maintain a healthy weight. And so there is definitely challenges you have to be aware of, I think, when when looking at the different protein options. Mm-hmm. What about like, um, I know Diana Rogers suggests in Sacred Cow that you can uh, feed the world because my brain, before I learned more, would say, no way in the world you're going to be able to have everybody doing regenerative farming. It's not possible. But she would argue that that's not true, that you can actually pull it off. What's been your experience with that type of question? I think 
the first thing that comes from mind for me to, if we are going to shift our food system towards that more model, um, and I'm sure people don't want to hear this, but it comes down to policy. I really mm-hmm. think that's the big thing that it comes down to. Um, not just here in the U.S., but you'd have to get, I mean, we're a global marketplace, right? There's importation and exportation of food, and there's a lot of it. And so you'd have to get policy change in a lot of different places um, to match with the goal of supporting regenerative um, over mm-hmm. you know, our current system. And so I think... Um, you know, when Diana Roger talks about it, I, I haven't actually heard her talk about it, but I'm, and I've read her book and we had her on the podcast too. So I'm surprised <laughs> I haven't like gone down this conversation with her, or maybe I have and Tara can jump in cause I, I don't remember it, but I'm wondering if she's talking about it from the standpoint that like we could handle it from, you know, like a land standpoint yeah. and like our farmers would be behind it and kind of like yeah. that emotional and environmental piece of it. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, at least in my personal opinion, kind of the driving factor behind it comes down to policy. You know, we have Mm -hmm. policy changes that encourage certain things within our food system to be where we are now. And I think that would have to come from that angle to kind of see the big movement we would want to kind of essentially redo our food system. On that note, I think some of it too would come down to price. You know, the food system we have right now is very readily available, very, you know, safe um, and very affordable typically. I mean, I know, you know, recent inflation aside that we've all been seeing, but uh, compared to other countries, we do have a very affordable food system, but kind of on that same note of policy versus, you know, price, if we have farmers in the U.S. who are doing regenerative practices, who are, you know, caring for their animals that are ensuring, you know, that workers have fair wages, and then we are importing beef from or importing foods, not just beef from other places that are not following those same standards, Mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot cheaper product and it's going to make it hard for, you know, American ranchers and farmers to compete with those products. Um, And that plays a challenge because as much as we'd all love to say we want like regenerative ag and better practices, you know, for a lot of people, it comes down to which you know, product is going to be cheaper at the grocery store. Um, Mm -hmm. And so if American farmers can't compete on the global market, that really puts us at a disadvantage as well. So policy and I think, you know, affordability of food um, kind of go hand in hand in this conversation. Yeah, I know uh, as I, cause I actually had Dan on my podcast as well. Uh, we should probably have links to both episodes, <laughs> yours <laughs> and mine, since we both love her and what she's doing. Um, but I remember one of the things she talked about is that a lot of the uneven land is not being utilized uh, because you can't grow the corn that way. And the uh, cows, of course, can kind of graze in those areas as well. So I think that was one of the talking points, and she had others. So I, I think the other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, you want to comment? I was just going to say our ranch here in Nebraska is actually a really great example of what Dan yeah. was talking about, the marginal land versus non. Yeah. Um, our ranch borders an area called the Nebraska Sand Hills. Um, it's a beautiful part of our mm. state. Not a lot of people know about it, but it is the, actually the world's largest, most intact ecosystem still. It's very diverse. It is beautiful grassland, um, and it is that way because of cows. Um, so, you know, shout out to cows on that front. But um, if you saw the grasslands, if you saw... Um, the sand hills, you would know that it is not suitable for like what Dana is saying. It's not suitable for crops. We aren't going to grow right. crops there. We aren't going to be planting right. things there. Um, so we can either maintain it through a grazing animal into the grassland it is, or you could industrialize it. And I'm not sure that right. is a win-win for our society. So um, yeah, she has a very valid point. Um, marginal land is a, a, a very important part of the conversation. So, so when you use the term marginal land, you're talking about the land that's not flat. Right. Just yeah. making sure. Yeah. And then it, my... people will also call it like arable versus non arable, I think, too. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of see um, some different language there used in the conversation. Okay. Yep. And, and could you also when you said ecosystem. Right. So could you kind of clarify what that means for the average person who would know? Yeah. So that's a really great thing. And it also falls kind of under that, you know, regenerative um side of farming, um, mm-hmm. cause the opposite end would be like monoculture. Um, so mm-hmm. it would be one right. plant, um, and that's all you kind of see. So if you think of like rows and rows of corn or rows and rows of soybean, um, when we think about regenerative ag or like I talked about the grasslands being an ecosystem, 
um, we think of everything kind of having life. So we think of the soil, we want to see a, a diverse ecosystem there. We want to see different bugs. We want to see different worms. Mm -hmm. um, we want to see the ecosystem within the plant. So when I drive out through our pasture, I want to see different plants. I want to see warm grass, you know, mm -hmm. cool summer grasses. I want to see fall and winter and you know, just a variety, you know, diversity is so important and the same thing from animals. And, um, so we want to see wildlife. It's actually a really great marker. Mm -hmm. Um, and we work with our local NRCS to, you know, put in wildlife habitats and do conservation methods that can help us as ranchers, you know, uh, coexist essentially with, um, wildlife. And so that's the really great thing is that when you're doing those regenerative practices and you're maintaining those grasslands and you're having those ruminants out grazing, mm -hmm. you're creating this really viable ecosystem where everything kind of works in concert together all the way from the soil up to the, you know, the mm -hmm. birds in the sky, um, which some people will then contrast pretty starkly with, um, like I said, kind of that monoculture cropping. Yeah. And I think that, you know, hearing those terms are important for us city folk, monocultures, <laughs> and uh, and knowing that, well, if you kill the bugs, the birds don't have anything to eat and then they have to mm -hmm. kind of either go somewhere else or they just won't survive. And, and that's the world we want to live in where we're allowing nature to kind of do its thing. Uh, and, and we take the best care of animals as possible. Uh, one, one more really quick question. Um, I assume when I learned a lot about regenerative farming, I always hear about which we're really not trying to use all those chemicals as much. So uh, how do you do that and not have the bugs eat up the crops or, you know, how is there a way to kind of balance that out? Or do you have to use more natural chemicals? Just a couple of thoughts about that. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so I feel like there is, again, going back to that regenerative, there is a spectrum here of what mm -hmm. people use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we're growing crops, we do use pesticides and herbicides because, you know, if we don't, we're going to end up with very little crop at the end. But it is right. it's a balancing act of not mm -hmm. overusing it, mm -hmm. um, but utilizing what you need to be able to continue growing a crop. And um, I think it kind of goes back again to that conversation of when you are a part of this, you see what's going on. Like if you see a field that has been wiped out by grasshoppers, you understand mm -hmm. why right. we ended up using different products and why right. they can be crucial. Um, and so I actually was talking to um, a wine, a wine grape grower recently, mm -hmm. and she said they had recently given up their organic status because it was not working for the practices they needed to do. And so they had found this kind of meld between the practices. And I loved hearing and learning about that because I think it was just so beautifully said that, again, it, it's not that checking of the box. It's figuring out what works for your land mm -hmm. and, and really trying to do the best by it. So not overusing, utilizing chemicals, but understanding there sometimes is a time and place where you need to use them. And I feel like that's kind of the approach that we try to take, you know, on our farm. Yeah. One of the things I shared during my symposium speech was this ideal of not living in the extremes, right? So don't be the vegan who uh, has a fit when he sees somebody, he or she sees somebody wearing a leather jacket, you know, don't be the carnivore who won't, you know, consider you in a carnivore club if you're um, not hunting and killing the animal yourself, or if you're, you, they, we're going to kick Dr. Paul Saladino out of the carnivore <laughs> club because he eats, you know, fruit and honey. Uh, the extremes don't work. And I think to not benefit from technology is not logical, uh, but to not overdo technology is not logical. So I like that balance. And again, those extreme way of thinking is what will get us into trouble. Now, you guys have a podcast and a docu-series. I would love for people to hear what what's your goal with that and, and what kind of what could they expect to see if they check those things out? Yeah, earlier on in the podcast, you mentioned something about um, you know, doing your research and um, not taking the headlines for, you know, for verbatim and um, kind of how we live in a society where you could find whatever you want to support your current thought, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to choose a vegan lifestyle, you could follow a ton of accounts that tell you all the reasons why you should. And if you want to live a carnivore lifestyle, you could follow all the accounts that tell you why you should. And you can kind of feed your own bias, right? And I think that is kind of at the core of why we just started Discover Ag, honestly, is because as we've been talking, you know, for the last 45 minutes now, 
there's a lot of nuance to raising food. Um, there's a lot of balance. There's a lot of things to consider. There's a lot of ripple effects if you make changes that I don't think we always consider. I think we can get very narrow minded when it comes to our food system and practices and the way you know it should move forward. And that was kind of the point of our podcast. We really wanted to bring deeper conversations. We wanted to go beyond the headlines. We wanted mm-hmm. to um, give the perspective of a you know two millennial female farmers um, when maybe that's not the voice people are hearing when it comes to the food system. And so we started the podcast because it's long format. So you can, you know, have those deep conversations that you're not getting in a nine second reel or that the headline on the article is, you know, just five words. And we chose to, uh, we're a Thursday podcast. So every Thursday we break down three uh, top kind of trending things that are going on in the ag food space. So we really wanted to pull current events, current things that consumers would be concerned about, have questions about, you know, see in the headlines. Um, and then, like I said, we break them down and give more facts, have more conversation, mm-hmm. kind of weigh both sides and discuss, you know, maybe why that choice was made or why, you know, whatever the article is, um, but just really have more conversations. I think, um, you know, conversations are really lacking in today's society mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. That's fair. Um, so just not to put you guys on the spot, but again, going back to my talk, it was about how vegans and carnivores can live in harmony. And um, and I had various talking points to help express that. But when you guys think about, you know, having a conversation with a vegan, you've done that, I'm sure, uh, many times. You know, what what would you say are ways that we can uh, either have that conversation or that you feel are the things that connect us that should allow us to all kind of be okay living with each other. I mean, I think what connects us all is food, right? Like we mm-hmm. all have a love for food, no matter what choices we're making within that. And a big thing that Natalie and I stand for, which we've said is food choice. Uh, so when having conversations with someone, you know, on the opposite side of the spectrum from us in these conversations, it is food choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an aunt who loves almond milk and I always tell her, I don't care. You can, you can love almond milk. You're not going to offend me. Um, because I, I do, I believe people have to pick what works for them and why they're doing something, you know? Um, and so, when you're having these conversations, it's kind of like, well, tell me why you're choosing that food. So Mm -hmm. for my aunt, she's choosing almond milk because it's a low calorie option. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You're not choosing it because you're trying to get more protein. You're not choosing Mm -hmm. it because you think it's better for the environment. You know, those are conversations that I, you know, will go to bat for animal proteins for is they are not bad for the environment and they are a nutrient powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that doesn't make plants bad. Um, just like if you are vegan, it doesn't mean that, you know, animal protein's bad. It, it is finding that middle ground of being able to understand that we're each an individual body. We each have a unique genetic makeup and what works for one person in food does not work for another. Um, and so there's never going to be a right or a wrong answer in our food choices. Right. Culture, I mean, culture plays a huge role in food of what different cultures eat. And so just being able to take into account that each of us is going to have our own preference, preference, our own bias, our own mm-hmm. thoughts about our food, and that we can just just bond over the fact that we are enjoying our meal, that we're enjoying time together, you know, around a table um, and just kind of approaching it from that angle is I feel like, you know, that's where we have common ground. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And I agree with all of that. I definitely echo some of those comments uh, during my talk and totally agree. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things I shared as we kind of get close to wrapping up here. um, you know, we have our our Mondays and Fridays in New York uh, being basically plant based, right? And if we were to flip that, what would that feel like? So, if you have a a person who's plant based, and we have uh, you know meat uh, Fridays, you know, and you can't eat plants, what would that feel like? Do we really want to live in a world where we? force people to eat what we perceive as the best diet for them? Or do we want to live in a world where people are educated about the various dietary patterns and then they have choice? That choice should be given to us. That choice should be given to our babies. And that should be a very, it's such a common sense approach uh, because nobody should be told, you know, what they can eat or can't eat. So so let's think about you guys um, as we all are trying to take our journey towards metabolic health. We know it's more than just our food. And my acronym is a, it's a nest and a rope. If you're going to 
you need a rope to get to the nest because we're not birds, right? We talked about birds today. The, the, the R is for relationships. The O is for avoiding organisms and pollutants that harm us. The E is for making sure our emotions are protected and we have life experiences that serve us. Now, if you get to the nest, the N is for nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, protecting our thoughts and recovering from trauma. So when you think about all of those root causes that can lead to harm if you don't take care of them, where do you guys hope to focus your attention over the next year? Yeah, I really loved your acronym. They're such good um, focus points for people. And I think you can't go wrong choosing, you know, two out of the how many ever are there, um, which yeah. is what I love because I feel like they all are are so vital and important that it's kind of like start with whatever works for you. And then if you can get to, you know, all eight of them, then amazing. Like you're doing a really right. good job. And so I love that you have that for your community. I for sure taking that from this podcast and kind of carrying it forward with myself. Nice. Um, you know, I touched on earlier, the animal protein was a big thing or actually, um, I didn't touch on this podcast. We touched on it in a mini video that you're putting out on some of your channels. And so, mm-hmm. you know, That's one right. thing I've been focusing on is increasing my animal protein, um, in my diet. Another thing I've really been focusing on is sleep quality. Um, so, I'm really trying to abide by pretty strict um, screen times before mm-hmm. bed and in the morning, which I have not always been the best about, especially when my job is a lot of it online. And so I'm just trying to get back to a place. I don't have sleeping problems, but I think it's another one of those things that the more and more you learn about how important it is for your health, the more you want to just kind of have a really good sleep hygiene, um, Mm. almost habit. And so I'm really Mm -hmm. trying to kind of cultivate that a little bit better. And then I'm definitely, um, huge for me has always been being outside. And so the environment part is really big for me. Um, I love to, especially being in a state, Nebraska, that is four seasons and, uh, you know, not one of the warmest seasons being one of the four. I love to spend as much time outside as I can during the warmer months. And it's really crucial for my mental health. I can really tell a difference um, when Mm -hmm. I am inside too long or just not kind of out at nature, which is one of the reasons why I love my job so much. And so I, I'll carry that with me forward too as a, a main focus is really as we start coming into these fall and winter months, um, you know, what can I do to continue um, the amount of time outside that I get now that it's summer? Nice. I was talking to Maria Emmerich, uh, and, you know, who authored all those wonderful books with her husband, Craig, a few weeks ago. And I, they spent time in Hawaii and... Um, She's like, I don't wear anything on my feet for Mm -hmm. probably six months out of a year. And we've heard of that term grounding. Uh, But then I learned later that grounding can also occur in the water. Who knew, right? Because you're still connected to the Mm -hmm. earth. So, but yeah, but when you're connecting to nature and to the earth, you end up um, really giving your body some of the things that is those things that you just don't think about, but it needs. And I went out today uh, and it was a little too hot to be out there a long time, but I just needed to get out Mm -hmm. and be out there as long as I could. And you just feel better having connected with uh, Mother Nature and the Earth. So so I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing. I appreciate your passion. I, I think we need more soldiers, like I mentioned earlier, who are doing this work. And uh, I'm just happy that I've learned enough to at least put you guys in front of people and, and also give me a way to be thoughtful about the food. And, 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 and I need to, I, I don't think I've done this much in the past, but just I, I have some ribs uh, cooking as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, as I consume them, I, I'm going to, with me and my wife, we tend to eat together and I'm going to say, listen, let's honor this piece of meat, maybe in a way we haven't done before, right? And I think that's the type of stuff I've learned from you guys and others who spend a lot of time thinking about this topic. So, so I really appreciate you guys. Let's briefly pause and make sure people know how to reach you guys. So what's the best way they can find the work you're doing? Yeah. So Natalie mentioned our podcast, Discover Ag. So if you're listening to this, you're obviously a podcast person. You can find us over at Discover Ag Podcast. Um, You can also find us on Instagram at Discover Ag. And then you can follow our personal channel. So if you want to learn a little bit about dairy farming and our life on the farm, you can follow me at Tara Vanderdusen. And then my personal channel is Natalie Kavoric. Nice. All right. So 
Um, I want to thank you guys for finding me. I'm happy we have connected. Uh, I was going to hit Dr. Anthony Chafee in the chest just to thank him, but then I paused. I said, that may not be a good idea. <laughs> so, so I appreciate all the folk out here doing this great work. And I, that's one of the gifts of the podcast is that you meet wonderful people and uh, share your visions and learn from each other. And I really appreciate that. So thanks, guys, again, for being here today with me on the podcast. Appreciate you guys. Thank you thank so you. much for having us on. Absolutely. So as I wrap up, I'm happy that we have uh, some models who are, you know, modeling what we need to do to make the world a better place. And that's what today's guests are. They're modeling uh, a different way of farming and ranching. And, and I really think uh, that modeling has given us the rationale for if we just change how we do things, uh, we may, there's hope right? There's an alternative model that may be better than our current model. And I'm really happy. I've learned some things today that I didn't know. Uh, I'm inspired by uh, the, the ideal of sustainable agriculture. And, uh, and I'm really exp insp you know, just hopeful that people who don't understand it know a little bit more about it. And, and I think this is probably one of the biggest bridges, other than just letting people do what's best for them, which I think is the most important thing. But it's a way to kind of honor the fact that if plants are being, uh, if, we ra if, we, if we have monocrops, we're going to hurt animals. And obviously, at some point, animals are being consumed for food. So there's always this need to uh, understand that's what the world is. And if we understand how it works, we use a better technique to do this work, I think that there will be more people uh, interested in using that as a, a unifying force. So I'm really hoping that'll happen. So so I hope you learned something today. If you did learn something, why not jot it down in the comments, share your thoughts, your experiences, anything that would help somebody else who's on a similar journey. And I really want to thank everybody who came to this episode of the Protecting your next podcast and until we do it again continue to be safe be well and continue to protect your nest you've been listening to protecting your nest with dr tony hampton for more visit drtonyhampton.com